This morning's word comes to us from 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 through 21. The scripture reading is available in your bulletins as well as the screen in front of you. So if you're there, I invite us to, to rise in body or in spirit as we always do at Christ's community so that we can honor God's holy word. And I'm going to invite us to read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love we love because he first loved us if anyone says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for who who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Let's go to God in prayer once again. Jesus, we say we love you, but many times we don't realize what that love entails. So as we dive into your word, speak to us, open up our hearts, minds, and souls to be attentive to what you have to say to us and for us. It's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. Church, have you ever been asked, why do you love your hobby? Or why do you love this? Why do you love that? Why do you love your job? Why do you love your spouse? I've been asked that many times. Why do you love your kids? But that question changes quite a bit when you start using the word how. How do you love your job? How do you love your spouse? How do you love your kids? How do you love your family? Many times we can compare and contrast with invisible love versus visible love. Now we're skipping verses 7 through 12, so we can focus from verse 13 through 21 today. But verse 7 through 12 is teaching us how important that invisible love is because that invisible love in return impacts the visible love in our being and who we are and what we say and what we do. That invisible love is so important, it transforms into that visible love. That love of God was made manifest among us so that we might live through him. How can we live through him? Verse 13, because he has given us of his spirit. We've received that Holy Spirit. Before any conversation on tangible love, before any conversation on blessings from above, we cannot start without the Holy Spirit. You see, the Greek word for his spirit here in this passage is literally defining an active participation in the Spirit of God. So when you talk about his spirit, it's not just a one-time thing, a one-time lifetime guarantee. Here, Deanne, no, it's an active participation. That spirit is not dead. It doesn't come in and go, all right, I'm in now. Let me, let me relax. All right, uh, uh, let me work from home and let, let me just relax. No, that spirit comes into our heart and is actively participating in our lives. That's what the Greek is trying to, to emphasize for us here. You see, when a follower of Christ exhibits true love of Christ, they are drawing from that love that one has received from God's spirit. 
The source of that love and the power of that spirit it should lead us to our confession for Christ. The spirit we received should lead us to obedience, and that obedience should lead us to a life abiding in Christ. Verse 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the, to, to be the Savior of the world. John's teaching the importance of these words, seen and testify. So with the receiving of the Holy Spirit, that leads us to obedience in abiding in Christ. And then that should ultimately lead us to experience and testify that indeed the Father hath sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world. Because that invisible becomes visible through the love of Christ that the follower of Christ exhibits and lives out. That's why one can testify with the words, no one has seen God, but believers who abide in him have seen the Son. You see, the words seen and testify are strategically placed here in this passage so that the readers that John is writing to can be reminded that the importance of this gospel truth has not changed since day one. They have seen it. They have seen it before. This is not new. So now you are called to testify in it. So if you think about it, John wasn't trying to write this individually. He's also trying to write this corporally. The singular words becomes plural in this passage. So in a Christian community, love abides in a way where believers can witness and experience the life that Christians possess by this new birth. I invite you to look at verse 15 and 16 with me. Whoever confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the the love that God has for us, God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Confession in Christ, church, it's not what we do, but it's who we are. Confession in Christ is who we are in Christ. You see, I'll give you an example. If I confess my love for my son, it's not necessarily because of what he does for me. Oh, my son does this for me. He makes breakfast for me. He's not, he he doesn't. He's, he's, He's not even four yet, you know? Oh, you know, my son makes my resume look good. No, that's, no. You see, confession of love for my son is because that is who I am and that is who he is. I'm his father. He's my son. My dad teases me sometimes and he says, you know, just you wait. And I was like, what do you mean? He's going to mimic not just your good traits, but your bad traits too. Like me. No, he's such a sweetheart. He's like, just you wait. But see, it's not what he does that makes me love him more or love him less. It's who he is. That's my son. It's so funny that, uh, you know, my, my, my mother-in-law, her, her love language is gifts, right? And, and she always wants to get him something. And, and if you've been to our home, Our son doesn't need anything. (laughs) He has one too many toys, right? But when he picks up the FaceTime call with with his grandmother, right, it's like he doesn't say, hi, grandma, how you doing? The first words that are out of his mouth is, hey, when are we going to Target? (laughs) Or let's go to Target. And then those are moments where I have to tell him, no, that's not why you love your grandmother. (laughs) You love your grandmother because she is your grandmother, not because she takes you to Target or Target, you know? You see, confession of love is not what we do, but who we are. Confession equates to that abiding relationship with God because since God is love, whoever lives in God lives in that love, but that love is also living in them. 
Love can't be just talked about as just an action, but it's something that's alive and well, living in our hearts. Love is not just words, but it's what's alive in our hearts, yet sometimes we don't even realize that. Verse 17 and 18, this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Loving others as God loved us is not easy. Loving and praying for enemies as Jesus taught us is not easy. Some of you are already nodding your heads. Mm -hmm. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ who drive us up the wall is not easy. Can I get a witness? Right? But if you begin to reflect on the fact that this love is not any kind of love, that should change and transform how we approach love in the first place. We're fearful of that love because we're thinking, oh, we can't love that person. That person drives me up the wall. Him and or her and that per and I are just completely different. How can I love that person? But that means we have to reflect on how we approach love in the first place. One commentary puts it this way. By the way, we love others. We will make visible the invisible God this world so desperately needs to see and come to know. Let me paraphrase phrase that for us. If we approach love with the attitude that I'm going to make the invisible God visible through how I love, that changes things. If you come approach love in a way where hmm, I might actually impact or change this person for the rest of their life because God might use me as a vessel in this moment, that might change things. If you're so hung up about, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, oh man, that, that person drives me out the mall, that means you're forgetting about the source of this love and the power and the transformation of this tough love that can make the invisible visible. There is power in God's love. There is power in God's abiding love. John Stott once said this, it's obviously easier to love and serve a visible man than an invisible God. And if we fail in the easier task, it's absurd to claim success in the harder. Whew. What a truth bomb right there. You see, some can continue to talk about how hard loving like Christ loved is. But, but, uh, but John leads us to these words in verse 17, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. You see, the boldness and confidence should lead us to trust that the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts. The boldness and confidence here is not what we get because of this love. It's what we already have because of this love. We have this boldness and confidence in the day of judgment because of that love. And that makes God's love complete. Let me give you another example. How many of you had those birthday candles where you blow them out and it just lights right back up? Can I get a witness? We've been there, right? So you blow out the candles and all of a sudden it lights back up and everyone in the room is just on the floor laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, we got you, right? But usually, when you're that birthday person, you're not afraid. Oh, my goodness, are these candles not going to blow out? You laugh. Ah, yeah, you got me. But you're not fearful if that candle attacks you. You're not fearful of, oh, my goodness, that candle is just going to explode and there's going to be more, more fire. No. You kind of laugh it off. <laughs> yeah, you got me. And you keep trying to blow out the candle, or if you get fed up, you just... Take the candle out, you throw it in the sink, right? Or the toilet, or whatever you do, right? But that to us is fear. You see, the candle ultimately gets blown out, and we know that. But that to us is fear. Fear is punishment. Fear carries these consequences for us. Such fear hinders God's complete love. 
We can have all these lists of fears. But with God's abiding love, guess what? That fear eventually gets blown out. But we let that fear captivate us in that moment. But that fear, like the light up candles, it's ultimately going to get blown out anyways. That fear is going to evaporate anyways because God's love never fears judgment or punishment. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to, you know, make this all sugar-coated, lovey-dovey. I'm talking what the Bible is saying. God's love is going to wipe away fear of judgment and fear and punishment. God's love is bold and confident. So why do we succumb to fear when it's going to be evaporated anyways? Maybe not in that moment. Maybe not in that moment when you get, oh my goodness, and you get so frustrated, it's not blowing out, right? But it ultimately will blow out. But that's fear for us. You get so frustrated and you're fearful and, you, and you're trying to, you know, defend, you know, and you're just trying to make all these words and, and arguments to, to try to reflect and deflect, right? But what if you just take a step back and that fear, let that fear disappear? God's love can do that. Why? Because verse 19, we love because he first loved us. How he loved us, how he loves us should lead us into a posture of gratitude of who we are in Christ. You see, if you're too busy counting and wondering if you're even with God or whether or not God heard your prayers, you're missing the point. You see, we can love others and we can exhibit his love because of the character of who God is. It's because of the origin and root of what God's love is. God's love is alive and well. God's love doesn't fit into a worldly agenda to our comprehension. If you don't understand godly love, right, that makes sense. That makes total sense because we have faith in that godly love that it will fit into his agenda and his way and in his will. So if his love is alive and well, it's transforming us to where we shouldn't be the same person yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If our relationship with Christ is continually growing, right? When you meet me, you, I shouldn't be the same person as last week. And in a couple weeks from now, I shouldn't be the same person as today. Because God's love is working in my heart. It's working in my life. God's love is perfected in us. God's love overflows in words and actions to others. Church God took the initiative, not us. Why are we so busy trying to take the initiative? Why are we so busy trying to burden ourselves when God already sent Jesus Christ to take the burden for us? Here's why loving others is so tough. It's because we look for the worldly source for loving others, not the heavenly source. We don't look for God the Father. We look for worldly commonalities and perspectives. Think about it. When you try to find that friend, and people say it's harder to make more friends as you get older. And I'm not that old. Maybe I am old. But I, I, I'm beginning to realize that. It's harder to make new friends as I get older. We look for common ground. We look for the, the common perspectives. We look to surround ourselves. Jen, uh, my, my wife, you know, she calls me out sometimes. She says, you know, I think you have a hard time making friends uh, with people who are not pastors. Ooh, truth bomb right there. It's like you don't know how to be friends with non-Christians. Another truth bomb right there. And I had to reflect. And that was because I was trying to surround myself with people of a common thread. And I wasn't trying to find myself with people who believe God the Father is the heavenly source of this love. Verse 20 and 21 is incredibly expi explicit. It's almost like John was fed up. And if I can be brutally honest with the 21st century church, if you're looking for a church for comfort and you're say, you're, you say you're a Christian, you're a liar. If you say, I love Jesus, yet missing out on opportunities to be with your church family because you, uh, of your, your job's more important, you're a liar. 
If you do not have the capacity to love others, yet you say, oh, I love God, you're a liar. God, through John, is calling us out and dropping these truth bombs left and right and calling us a liar. I don't know about you, but I don't like it when people call me a liar. But that's what John is doing right here. He's saying, oh, don't you dare say you love God, but you go out and you start talking smack about that person. Don't you dare say you love God. Maybe you don't love God. God, through John, is calling us to walk in the truth. Verse 21 can be a summarizing verse to wrap up all of chapter 4. Verse 21, he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. He has gifted us the Holy Spirit. He has gifted us with this holy command. And this was not a suggestion. This was not a recommendation. So let me end with this. Church, do you love God? No, no, no. I mean, do you live like you love God? It's in that love that he commands us and calls us to exhibit and share with others this is not a comfortable kind of love. Who says this is a comfortable kind of love? No. This is tough love. We're called to sit in that holy discomfort. Do you think the father sending his son as the world savior was convenient and comfortable? Oh, church at 1030, that's a little too late. Uh, can we do it at 930 uh, because I got to get on my boat? All right. Or uh, church at 11 a.m., oh, that's, uh, I'm sorry, it's church at 9 a.m., oh, man, that's too early. I'm going to go to that church at 11 a.m. because I want to sleep in a little more, right? Do you think God the Father said, hmm, all right, let me send Jesus Christ, my son, my one and only son, uh, not this year because uh, uh, the Romans and the Jews, uh, no, maybe I'll, uh, let me wait a couple years and be more comfortable and, do you think Jesus Christ went on the cross and he's like, God, I, this isn't really comfortable. Being nailed to the cross, it's not really comfortable. Can I do it in some other way? Some of you are like chuckling because what I'm saying is ridiculous. But that's how ridiculous it is when we think that gospel is comfort. When we think God's love is comfort. The father sent his son because he knew what needed to be accomplished. He was confident. He had faith. You know, I, I know we use the word polarity and division quite often when we talk about what's going on in our country and our world. But I'm going to challenge you to flip the script a bit. I'm going to challenge you this morning to th try to think about it this way. Maybe it's not that we're divided. Maybe this world is hurting. Maybe this world needs Jesus. Just maybe this world is waiting for the ambassadors of Christ. You and I, church, to step up to the plate to love God and love others. May that be our identity and who we are in Christ in our heart and what we do in Christ as we continue to seek him in every moment of our lives. Let us pray.